Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Thought I'd have a quick look at a few things going on. Not a lot. <laughs> it just isn't a lot at the moment. But, uh, so be it. Um, I've had a good season, I would say. I had a marvellous spring. All the sort of winter resting dendrobiums, bar a couple, performed well. Some of them outstandingly well. Um, couldn't be more pleased in that arena. Um, obviously my thoughts are now moving towards repeating it. In other words, you know, doing the same again this year. Exactly the same. I don't plan on changing anything for the winter resting dendrobiums. It's taken many, many attempts at going through the autumn process of slowing stuff down and getting through the winter, changing temperatures, light levels, playing with the environment and I believe last winter I finally got it probably as good as it's ever going to be. Um, and so I can now just repeat the process and de-worry the whole process, <laughs> which is good. You know, that, that's been a struggle. I suppose five, maybe six years I've been trying to play with that, you know, get it right. Um, but no plans on changing it this year, just repeat the process, um, which is now, for me, straightforward because I think I've finally got it as close as it's ever going to be. So that are good. Um, <clears throat> I am getting lots of ideas for videos. Of this are also good. Very good, in fact. Thank you, everybody with suggestions. Um, it's good from the point of view that it gives me the ideas. Um, all I will say is that um, the videos might not be immediate, following the comment, if you see what I mean. There's a, there's a, sometimes there's an order to things and several ideas can be collected together and sort of covered in a single video. And um, a lot of questions that quite honestly would take too long to answer in a comment or an insufficient answer, because sometimes pictures play a much better role than words, especially with me, because I ramble. Um, so quite a few of those sort of things are going to get collected together and will probably form part of the old Sunday morning chat type things where I've got chance to point the camera at individual plants and chat about things. So, you know, sort of, a, which is good because the ideas for the Sunday morning chat have got a bit thin on the ground lately as well. Um, anyway, what was I coming out here for in the uh, first place? Oh yes, this is... We looked at these buds a while ago. This once was Oncidium varicosum and its variety Rogersii, <laughs> which is good, um, balding, um, in quotes, that sort of thing. Um, but it's had its name completely changed. It's not called that anymore. Nonetheless, it's a dancing lady type looking Oncidium. Um, it's not the best looking plant at the moment, it lost its root system for a bit and was surviving on next to no roots. Um, the pseudo bulbs on this should look roughly like that, perhaps not quite so ridged, but given the size of this pseudo bulb, that's a small pseudo bulb, nonetheless it's blooming. Yeah, These older bulbs are desiccated. Whether that's natural for this type of Oncidium or not being a species, I don't know. Um, some Oncidium types do um, progress forwards, grow new pseudo bulbs and leaves, hopefully bloom, and for each one you get you'll often find an older bulb will drop its leaves. And you can often end up with an Oncidium type, top type as long as it's not, especially if it's not really happy, really doing well, you can end up with a single bulb with leaves and all the others have lost their leaves. I mean, I'm not far off that now. Um, this probably won't produce a new growth till after it's finished flowering. And this bulb here behind it is down to one leaf, although that still looks healthy. Um, and the other two bulbs are leafless and have been for some time. So I've got one fully leaved bulb and one leaf sat behind it. So there's not a lot of... Um, strength coming from the photosynthesis side of life for this orchid so uh, it's up to me to keep the other end of the orchid going if you see what i mean you know <laughs> um but these buds are now we looked at them a, a short while ago and i said it's unusual to see buds that look black and explain why um a bud is basically three sepals that's all you can see 
Um, so those will become the three sepals when it opens. Um, but the lip on this is large and a lovely bright yellow. You can now see the yellow starting. Yeah, But the sepals are almost black, hence the colour on the buds. So that's coming soon. This is one of my favourite Oncidium blooms of the Oncidium dancing lady types. In fact, I've only got a couple nowadays. Um, I've got sweet sugar struggling somewhere down in the um, heap of struggling types. Um, but at least this one's going to bloom. It's not a marvellous spike. I mean, these spikes are capable of branching and producing several blooms on the branches. So it's a simple spike, just a single spike. But nonetheless, I'm really looking forward to those coming soon. Um, the Sherry Baby buried up the back here. Um, you might think, why is that buried up the back when it's actually open? Well, it, for me, these blooms are nothing special. I only keep that plant for the fragrance. You know, the blooms for me are a little boring. Um, but the fragrance is powerful and I love the chocolate vanilla type smell. Some just say chocolate, some say vanilla, some say chocolate vanilla. vanilla. The bleh, my mouth won't work, more coffee nurse. Um, some do go for the vanilla end of the fragrance. For me it's more chocolate than vanilla, but there is a hint of vanilla in it. So uh, that's how I see it anyway. Um, <clears throat> what else? Um, I did say that um, having got my Dracula to produce some spikes, I would have to hang it. Well, that's where it now lives, and boy does that moss dry out fast now. It's directly in the line of fire of one of these little computer fans to keep it cool. Of course, that dries the moss off really quickly. And the only... This methodology that I got from a guy who did a talk at the Orchid Society is based on loose live sphagnum moss. Um, well, if the moss dries out too often, it's going to die back. As you can see, it's, I mean, that's still slightly damp, but it's been used to standing in water. So it's now drier than it once was. It's, the, the, the moss itself may have to acclimatise, but the moss should be loosely packed. And if you pour water at quite a rate on top of any sort of pot with moss in it, the water will compact it. Slowly but surely, each time you water it, that moss will compact and start shutting out the air. Yeah? So you lose the sort of oxygen content in the media, which is not good. The roots need some of that. So, uh, so the only sensible way to water that is to dunk it. I can't dunk it in the Vander bucket. <laughs> you frazzle the roots because the feed level's too high. So this has now become a problem. But it is going to flower. So you have to weigh up the problems with the good side. But that now is a nuisance plant. While it was sat in the tray of water, it was fine. Now it's not. It's a bit of a nuisance. But hopefully the reward will be one of the larger Dracula, Dracula blooms. So uh, Dracula blooms. Oh, I'm really having, having a real mouth problem this morning. <laughs> Perhaps I ought to go and do some facial exercises and warm it up rather than filming first thing in the day. I haven't even got dressed yet. Um, but... If I film before all the fans come on while it's cooler out here, I feel more comfortable doing the filming. Once the fans fire up and everything, which they probably will do today, there's not a cloud in the sky. But um, temperature's quite cold last night. I don't know what we got down to out here. I did reset this yesterday because it was predicted to be colder last night. So let's pick it up. What did we get then? Nighttime temperature. Just over 15. Yeah, no, that's quite cool. Still, still flipping August at the moment. That's quite a cool night. Bearing in mind this is under glass, don't forget. I think I'll reset that and see what we get down to tonight. But yeah, obviously some of the plants really appreciate that cool night. You know, there's some, some of the catlias really like that differential. It does them the world of good and can induce blooming. So um, it is appreciated. But I've got to watch it. I don't want it getting too low yet. The growing season's not finished. You know, I don't want things starting to slow down because the nights are getting cold. Not yet. Um, it's way, way too early to even start thinking about getting a heater going out here. But I've got a sort of semi-heat control here. It's called the door behind me. Yeah? Well, when we had um, all the heat and everything like that, um, I used to shut that door 
and keep it shut so that this was a self-contained unit with the um, well, sometimes cooler air coming in the inlet fan and the hotter air getting sucked out of the extractor. Um, but now, um, if I think I'm going to get a cooler night that might head down a little bit too low and start triggering slowing processes, um, I just open the door before I go to bed. Now that means the humidity won't get as high during the night, but it's plenty high enough. Yeah, I mean, it, um, last night I left the door open and it still got down to 15. Um, but the humidity didn't drop, you know, it was around 80 overnight, so you know, it's, it works okay. And I'll keep using the door because obviously the house stays reasonably warm. Um, there's, there's no heating on in the house, it just does. You know, houses do that. Um, so uh, I can use the door as a temperature regulator for night times anyway. Um, I don't have the door open during the day simply because I don't want the humidity to drop during the day. I'd rather keep it up. So uh, I use the door for that function. Um, yeah, so uh, quite a few questions to answer, which I'm planning on. I've, I've got a notebook and I just scratch ideas down as I'm going along. Each morning I look at the comments. If an idea pops up, scratch it onto the notebook. And then, um, you know, come Sunday morning, I'll have a little list. Um, so th yeah, that, that's that's working well. I, I'm, I'm liking that. Um, what else? Oh, there is tucked up behind here. Coming soon is one of the Latoria types. Two spikes. Buds are forming their patterns now, so they won't be too long in opening. That's Dendrobium Nora Tokanaga, crossed with Aberans. So. Uh, a hybrid cross with a species basically. Aberans, um, one of the Latoria type species, does get into quite a few crosses. Um, I think it's probably used more for the patterning than anything else. Um, it's, I don't think it's used for size because it's not a large bloom as uh, Latorias go. But uh, anyway, coming soon. And the other thing that I know people are looking forward to, and I hope I just don't get caught out here, my Neos don't look good. Uh, I mean, this one has got quite a bit of yellowing going on here, and I think it's a root-related issue. Um, and I had a look, I thought, perhaps that moss is completely broken down and it's starting to cause an issue. Well, they've only been in that moss a year. You know, I mean, it, it, it's got some roots pushed down through and out the bottom of the pot, and it's got some up the top as well, some with growing tips. Um, but there is some yellowing going on there. Um, but um, the idea with these two is to repot them in the traditional Japanese style. Um, this one's got some dying leaves on it, but nonetheless the fans are pushing on, and this one did bloom earlier in the year. Um, there's another, another little fern to extract from a pot. Um, I tell you what too, whatever fern that is, that's not one I've got. Oh, it's quite nice when people donate ferns. It makes me wonder because I doubt if there's any way that fern spores could get in here and germinate. It is remotely possible, I suppose, but highly unlikely. So, where's that fern come from? Obviously it wasn't planted. The worst case scenario is that fern spores are surviving in what is supposed to be an inert version of the sphagnum moss that I use. Yeah? It's a remote possibility that they're surviving the treatment process for that moss. The moss doesn't survive, but maybe the fern spores do. Um, there's another big fern in a pot somewhere that I'm going to hoik out. I'll dig it out because I've mentioned it, you know. That's it. Make work for yourself, boy. I should be getting breakfast. But my um, uh, doodah um, cordigera encyclia, epidendrum, anyway, cordigera, that's got a fern that's pushing on quite well in it. Uh, that's one I haven't got, so I'm going to get that out and pot it. Um, now, obviously, the best time to get a fern out of a pot is when you repot the plant, because at, at that point your roots are exposed and you can tease the fern roots out. But I should just be able to lift that plant out of the pot and extract the fern and then just put it back in its pot. 
I don't think that's due for a repot. It's currently pushing out a lot of new growths and roots, so I could repot it, but, I, I, you know, there's no point in repotting for the sake of it. You know, if your media's not old and breaking down, you're going to disturb the plant one way or the other. And I personally, I only disturb plants when there's a good need. Old breaking down media is a high priority need. Um, clambering out of the pot and needing something a bit more accommodating is another reasonably high need. Although, quite honestly, there's an awful lot of orchids seem to do better when they're climbing out the pot. You know, in other words, they're under accommodated in the root arena rather than over accommodated. Over potting can slow plants down. I don't really understand why I don't need to. It's just a pattern that over a number of years, if you see it often enough, it sticks in your mind and you think that pot's too big for that orchid. You're repotting it, you look round at your pots you've got and you think, I need the next size down and I haven't got one. Yeah? So you pot it in a pot that's possibly a little bit too big. And they don't seem to do as well as when they're crammed in a pot and climbing out the sides. Um, not all orchids, but you know, it seems to be a pattern with quite a few. Certainly my Oncidium types that are in tight pots are growing better than those that are in bigger pots. And with those type of orchids, that's across the board. There aren't any exceptions. All the ones that are crammed in small pots are growing like good ones and chucking roots out and filling the pots up with roots. And those that are in pots a little too large are not doing as well. So uh, I think, think that's just, just the way it is, you know. I mean, <laughs> I did a repotting video not too long ago where I crammed a, quite a large plant in the smallest pot I could get it in. And I, I, I could sort of feel people cringing at, at, at the process of, you know, cramming those roots in and then trying to get some media in around them. But I bet you anything that plant pushes on a lot quicker as a consequence. You know, this is just often the way it goes. You have to bear in mind that practically everything that we're talking about, they're, they're epiphytes, yeah? Um, and they're used to starting as tiny little plants, grabbing hold of something and hanging on to it for dear life and getting their roots in whatever's available. And sometimes that's next to nothing. You know, it's just the creases and crevices in the bark and that's all they've got, you know? So um, that is like being tight. Yeah, and you also get quite a few of the epiphytic orchids, especially the montane forest types. Everywhere is covered in moss and constantly wet and everything like that. And those orchids don't need huge root systems. They're constantly hydrated. The moisture in the air is incredibly high. They're always hydrated. They don't need a huge root system. <clears throat> Whereas you get something like a catlia destined to become a giant that's hanging on to almost bare bark, it's going to need a lot of roots to hold it in place and gather as much moisture as possible because it's not getting any by being covered in moss and stuff like that. So again, it forms a tight relationship with the crevices in the bark. So uh, flipping great big pots for epiphytes, epiphytes is probably not the best of ideas. Um, Right, oh, and right on the end, an update, a car saga continuation. Yesterday, at um, great inconvenience, I got another car, but I can't have it yet. <laughs> so I own it, but I can't have it yet. Um, the dork who bought my Saab on eBay, um, you, you can't, it's di difficult on eBay, you can't choose who buys your product, your item, yeah? And I've got a dork, basically. Um, obviously, after the car was bought as a buy it now item, the guy jumped in within an hour of me putting that on eBay. And I thought, oh, somebody's keen. This will be good. Sent an email saying, you know, contact me, make arrangements for collection and everything. Not a light. Another email. Email threatening an unpaid item dispute via eBay, which would put a strike on the guy's account, not a light, not a word. So I thought perhaps we ought to do a little bit of work. And looking at the guy's account, there are quite a few entries in his feedback saying time waster, never paid for the item, had to relist and stuff like that. 
So I've picked a duff, well I didn't pick it, but I've got a duff one. So um, I was going to open an unpaid item dispute, but it has a time thing. First of all, you have to wait 48 hours or eBay won't let you do it. And then once you do it, do it, do that, eBay gives the person four days to do something about it. Yeah, um, that's six days in total. I need this car gone on the grounds that the MOT is going to run out. And in the UK, if you don't, if you're on in a public place with your car, which mine is, it's out on a public road. If you haven't got a valid MOT, a statement of roadworthiness, it invalidates your insurance and you're not allowed to have an uninsured vehicle in a public place. It's actually quite a serious offence with quite a heavy fine. And the um, police and the agencies that enforce those sort of things, they drive around in little vehicles with number plate rec recognition cameras sat on the roof. And they just drive up and down roads. And as they go along, they check each number plate electronically back to the um, DVLC and check whether it's taxed. Yeah? Well, mine is tax, but if they do a full check, they will also find the, um, you know, the, the, is there a licensed driver associated with that number plate? And does that vehicle have a valid MOT? And is there an insurance policy with that number plate on it? And they can just do that in a flash as they drive along the road. So it's a high risk for me to let that MOT run out and it runs out on the 1st of September. So the car, the old car has now become a big deal. So I, I may get told off a little bit by eBay, although I expect they're a bit busy to bother with me. Um, I've canceled that um, order, basically. I just went in last night and I've had no response from the buyer, so I just canceled it. So he can no longer have it, simple as that. And the, the reason I put was out of stock or damaged. Very bland reason. You could, it's a little drop down. You only get a couple of reasons you can choose from. And that, that was the least offensive. You know, um, if anybody asked, somebody drove into the side of it and it's had an accident or something. But um, that now means I can get rid of it via another way. I found a salvage company that are pretty good. They've, they've given me a value and they will just come and take it away do the paperwork and it's gone, which is what I want. Um, but they've also got an auction op option, which you can set up and on the next working day for 24 hours, it's listed with all the salvage companies and they can bid on it, yeah? Um, and the starting price for the auction is the price that the company would have given me anyway. So. It tries to see if there's anybody else around that's willing to pay a bit more. So I'm going to let that run. Um, unfortunately, because it was Friday evening yesterday when I did it, that's not now going to get listed till Tuesday because it's a bank holiday Monday. So I've got to wait till Tuesday for the auction. That's then got to run 24 hours. And um, at which point somebody will come and take the car away from me. <laughs> not really fussed who, just get it gone. And I can't afford to insure two cars. So the car that I've bought has to stay with the car dealer until such time as my car is gone and I can transfer the insurance across. So it, I've got another car sat there waiting. It's got quite a little bang on the back wheel arch, but um, I class bodywork damage as cosmetic. It doesn't affect the running of the car. It might look a little bit tatty, but, you know, if your car looks a li little bit tatty in a car park, yours is the one that isn't going to get stolen. That's the way I look at it, so I class it as a bonus. I don't need immaculate, shiny, glossy paintwork. It does nothing for me. What I want is a car that starts and goes, and um, in this case is much, much cheaper to run, which this one is. So we have another car, and at some point, hopefully during next week, I should be able to go and get it and uh, get the paperwork transferred over to that one and we'll be mobile again but I found the car and I went off on the bus to get there well I had to get a bus to Bournemouth now I was lucky um, as I got to the bus stop there was a bus in the bus stop I actually ran to catch the bus and then when I got on the bus I looked around quickly to make sure nobody had seen me 
Oh, running for a bus, especially at my age. <laughs> anyway, so I got a bus into Bournemouth, and then the, the bus that took me to where the car dealer was, which was on the outskirts of Paul, um, well, Parkston, I suppose, but up that way anyway. And um, basically that bus only ran every half an hour, and I must have just missed one. So I had a hell of a long wait for that bus to come, and boy did that bus go round the flipping houses. It only had to go about four miles. <laughs> it took an hour. <laughs> so it took a hell of a long time to get there, looked at the car, tried it out, did all that, um, paid for it, um, and um, arranged for the guy to store it away somewhere safe until such time as I can collect it, which he was more than happy to do. Of course, then I had to get the bus back again. So I was out five and a half hours yesterday to, to, to view and try one car. But I have, a new, I have another car. Um, so car saga nearly over. All I need is the one out the front of the house, gone. And then we're up and running again. But, um, so probably late next week I would think something like that and next time when I go to collect the car hopefully my sister or her other half will give me a lift but um, they were in the middle of a birth saga <laughs> yeah my brother-in-law's daughter has uh, just given birth so obviously lots and lots going on to expect a lift under those circumstances was a non-starter so I didn't even ask but um, I should be able to get a lift over to pick the car up so car saga done back to orchids and still not much going on but first thing I need to do this morning um, the uh, mounts were all watered yesterday thoroughly and um, with a low you know with a small amount of feed and um, they won't need doing today because yesterday it rained a lot. I even got wet going to sort this car out. Well, that's a no-no. Um, so they won't need doing today. They're still damp. They'll be okay even though it looks like it might be a warm day so they can wait. Um, I'll have a look at the notes but I, I think the holy clay pots might need watering today especially if it's going to be a warm day. Um, I think they were done three days ago so I'll probably whiz around those. Those only take about ten minutes. And that needs a dunk, because that moss is starting to look a bit dry. Nuisance. You are a nuisance. What are you? Um, but apart from that, I haven't got too much to do out here. So, uh, um, I'll have a look at the video ideas. Um, I get days when I'm really into filming, and sometimes I'll film three or four videos in one day. I can store those up and knock them out as and when I get a, a day when I can't film or don't feel like it. So uh, I may get a couple of those done today. But apart from that, not much going on out here. It's just, like I say, that time of year. There's three Vanders, all three have got spikes just starting. Well, they'll be quite a while before those blooms come. My Orengus, uh, I mean, the buds are looking good on that, starting to swell. But that's probably, that's probably still a month away from blooming. Uh, don't hold your breath. Not with a Rengus, anyway. <laughs> and there's not much else. Um, the Twinkles, all three of them, the mounted one, um, they're all pushing out a lot of new growths, but they're a way off starting to produce the spikes yet. I mean, this has got seven or eight new growths, pushing on nice and strong, but they're not mature enough to start spiking yet. And potentially that, that's called Tiny Twinkle, that one. Um, when that does bloom, each one of the new growths, growths will produce a spike and some of those growths may produce two. So there's a mass bloomer down the line, but not for a while yet. It will probably be into late autumn before those spikes come. Now, you know, these, these new growths have got to mature. That's probably the most mature one. The bulb shape is just starting to form. But it's a way off spiking yet, so still got quite a wait. Oh, and the, um, the other, this Miltonia, the blooms don't last too long, um, but it's like a sequential one. You know, it, it produces, like its first bloom opens and the next bud's not ready, and then that one opens, and then the next one. So, I mean, this still has another bud on here, and the latest bud on here is just about starting to open, I think. Um, so there's still a few to open there, but the other Miltonia that's mounted, does have a little spike coming. Now that's um, that's a species, I believe, Cast Castanea or something like that. It's called. But I mean, that's got a little spike on it. That's only going to have a couple of buds. But you know, given that that was um, totally riddled with fusarium and had to be rescued to get a bloom spike, 
you know, isn't bad going. So uh, looking forward to that. Get back up there. Right, I'll leave it at that for this one. Um, as I said, uh, keep the ideas coming. Um, uh, some questions are simply answered and will probably be done there and then in the comments section, as you've seen me do in the past. I'm quite happy doing that sort of thing. But a slightly more complex or more detailed answer to some of those questions will, will go in videos. I think that's quite a nice way of doing it. That way the question can be repeated and the answer probably gets a wider audience. Yeah? I mean, if you leave a comment on one of my videos with a question, it may be that you're the only one that sees the answer. So I think, you know, doing some questions and answers on the video side of life might be a bit, uh, a bit better. More people get to see it. I just must remember to repeat the question before I give the answer. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not an answer. It's just a statement, isn't it? Uh, so we'll work on that. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll see you next time just to sort of update on life, the universe and things. And, um, you know, those, those questions are always there. And like I've said before, the answer will always be 42. I can keep that one running for a while. Still some people don't know what that is. Google it. Just Google what is the answer to everything. And it'll tell you. 42. It might even tell you why. <laughs> See you next time.